Hallelujah. 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 We give the Lord all the glory. We praise God for what we feel in the house here this morning. I tell you, I've been in places where I didn't feel what I feel here today. And I thank God for what we feel. Amen. I don't want to be a cold, dead, dried up church of a mortuary, but we want to be in a live house of a living God. And we serve a living God. We don't serve a dead God. We serve the living God. And he said these words, I am a God of the living and not the dead. Yeah. Praise the Lord. So if we serve a living God and we are a, a living people, then I think we are to act like a living people. Ain't that right? Yeah. I believe we are to act like a living people. Yeah. Praise the Lord and not be uh, cold, dead, dry bones. Yeah. Hallelujah. Well, how many is ready for the word of the Lord this morning? Yeah. Yeah. Praise God. I believe with all of my heart today that God has given me a word for such a time as this. Uh, I told you Wednesday night that I already the Lord had already given me the word for today and he had. He'd been working on this word for a while and uh, the Lord has led me to share that word this morning and I believe that it's for this people. I believe that you're not here by accident and I believe that this word today at the end of this message, whatever you choose to do with this word and how you choose to receive this word will forever change your life. It will either traject you into uh, your destiny, into your future. It will elevate you in the kingdom of God or it will either uh, leave you where you are at depending on what you do with the word that God has for this morning. Uh, Matthew's Gospel, chapter 18, where we're going to start. we got several places to go. But Matthew's Gospel, chapter number 18. Matthew, chapter 18. When the Lord called us to preach, Brother Chris uh, Langston, he, he called us to preach the whole Gospel, the entire Gospel. Amen. And sometimes things that we preach is not always easy. Sometimes things that we have to preach is not always fun. Uh, this is not always one of the funnest messages to preach, but it is one that is freedom given. It is one that will set you in the trajectory of your life. It will give your life new meaning, and I promise it will bless you if you receive this word and receive what God has for you through this word. Amen. If you need a change in your life and you want to go further in Jesus, can somebody shout amen? Amen. amen. Let me know we're on the right place here this morning. I know we are because the Lord has, has shown too many things to, to not know where we are today. So, Matthew 18, if you're there, say amen. amen. All right, Matthew 18, 21 says, Then Peter came to him and said, Lord, how often shall my brother sin against me and I forgive him up to seven times? And Jesus said to him, I do not say to you up to seven times, but up to 70 times seven. Therefore, the kingdom of heaven is like a certain king who wanted to settle accounts with his servants. And when he had begun to settle accounts, one was brought to him who owed him 10,000 talents. But as he was not able to pay, his master commanded that he be sold with his wife and children and all that he had, and that payment be made. The servant therefore fell down before him, saying, Master, have patience with me, and I will pay you all. Then the master of that servant was moved with compassion and released him and forgave him the debt. But that servant went out and he found one of his fellow servants who owed him a hundred denarii. That's, that's a hundred days wages. And he laid hands on him and took him by the throat saying, pay me what you owe. So his fellow servant fell down at his feet and begged him, saying, Have patience with me, and I will pay you all. And he would not. But he went and he threw him into prison till he should pay the debt. So when his fellow servant saw uh, what had been done, they were very grieved, and they came and took their master all that had been done. Then his master, after he had called him, said to him, You wicked servant. I forgave you all that debt because you begged me. Should you not also have had compassion on your fellow servant just as I had pity on you? And his master was angry 
and delivered him to the torturers until he should pay all that was due to him. So my heavenly Father also will do to you if each of you from his heart does not forgive his brother his trespassing. Let's pray one more time. Father, I thank you for the wording of your word. I thank you for what we feel in this house today. And God, now as we read this word, I pray that you would anoint these lips of clay. God, I'm nothing but your servant. And I pray, Lord, for the anointing of the Holy Ghost and fire to come down. And Lord God, I pray that you anoint this congregation, this body of believers, this assembly to hear and receive what the Spirit is saying to us this morning. And God, I pray that this word goes forth with boldness and clarity. And Lord, that the people would receive, their hearts would be ready. Lord, and the ground would be set to receive the seeds that are being thrown. God, I pray right now that you would just bless this word now and bless each heart and each life. In Jesus' name, we give you the glory. Amen, amen, and amen. Would you give the Lord one shout of praise? What you did say? Praise God. What a great and mighty God that we serve. Well, listen, I told you Wednesday night that uh, this word had a very strong connection to what we talked about in here Wednesday night. Some of you that were here know what we were talking about. Some of you uh, didn't get to make it, but uh, if not, you can go back and watch the video. I ain't got time to go over that now. There was a lot of stuff went over. But uh, anyways, Wednesday night, we hit on one thing. Wednesday night that we said, what we do individually affects the whole corporate body as far as this church body. What one does individually affects what goes on corporately in the church body. What do you say, Brother Chad? I'm talking about that when we mess up and when we sin and when we think that we're not hurting nobody else, when we fall short, and, and we all do that, right? We all fall short of the glory of God. I'm not just talking about little things, but I'm talking about things that we know we should not do. I'm talking about the sin that we try to hide. I'm talking about things that we, we push over to the side we allow to have power over us, and that thing controls us. And I'm talking about other things. But when we do these things, it begins to, we, we say, it's not hurting nobody but me. And I'm just going to keep it here. Oh, y'all getting quiet already. I'm just going to keep it here. Uh-huh. I know I'm on the right point now, so I'm coming out here to talk to you. I'm just going to keep it here. It ain't affecting nobody but me, preacher. Leave it alone. Uh, hey, it's not. But let me tell you something. Uh, when you begin uh, to, to water it down and you begin to cool off the, the temperature uh, in your own walk with God, uh, you begin to cool down the temperature in the corporate body. It's the same way when someone comes in that door uh, that's on fire for the living God. Uh, that fire will begin to spread throughout the corporate body like wildfire. It's very important uh, that we stay on fire for Jesus. Uh, it's very important uh, that we stay uh, in the Word. Uh, it's very important uh, because we build one another up uh, or we tear one another down. Uh, either you're in or you're out. Uh, but quit playing games. Uh, we got to get all in or all out. Come on, somebody. Uh, Jesus said uh, in the Revelation, He said, uh, I wish that you would either be hot or cold, uh, but this Luke warm stuff. Uh, I'm about ready to spew you out of my mouth. People don't like to hear that. Because they don't want to be one foot in the church door and one foot in the world. They, they want to sit in a window seat like you did in the middle of the back. Where they can be half in the church but they can still look out and see the things in the world. Friends, brothers and sisters, can I tell you something? This ain't the message yet. But I'm telling you, you cannot be playing games with the enemy while you're all in for Jesus. This don't work. It does not. Don't be lured by temptation. Uh, don't you give place to the devil. Uh, if you give the devil an inch, he's going to destroy your life. 
You give the devil an easy, don't take a mouth. He destroys your family. He destroys your home. He destroys marriages. He destroys kids. He said, my God, somebody needs to get a hold of this this morning. We, we say, oh, he does it, he does it. No, you've allowed him to come in. Woo! Now, this is what I'm trying to get to. Wednesday night we talked about in Joshua about the accursed things and how they brought accursed things into the camp and how God had already told them don't touch these things don't go around them don't touch them but they are accursed and they will be bringing a curse back into the camp and they will destroy the people has anybody here ever heard of soul ties Anybody in here ever heard of, of ties, so ties, that connections that you have with people? Let me put it like this. In the Old Testament, the Bible said that David and Jonathan, y'all know who I'm talking about, King David and young Jonathan? The Bible said that Jonathan's heart was knit together with David the king. In other words, they, those two become inseparable. They had a connection. They had a tie. They were something. And God means when he created us, he meant for us to have certain ties to one another. But now the enemy has come in along down the line and he has adulterated these things. And there is things that are called unhealthy ties. That there's people and things we have in our life that is unhealthy, that, that we are tied to and connected with. The same way that Joshua and, and the children of Israel, they had the accursed things that God told them, don't touch, don't bring in the camp. But now we have connected to our lives. People even. There is people. Listen, our family. When you were born, we have ties to our family. Your mother, your father. This is why when we become married, the Bible says you must leave your father and mother and go with your wife or your husband if you're a wife. And you two shall become one flesh. You have a tie that is a healthy tie. Now, some might be in a dysfunctional marriage that God never intended. That's not a healthy. Huh? Unequally up, yes. Now, anyways, let me get in here to the other part of this. I'd say I'm losing people already. Come on. I got you, brother. I'm going to get somewhere with this in just a moment. Because there's people, listen, there's people that are connected to you from your past. And some in this room this morning, I know for a fact God doesn't spoke to me before I ever, before I ever come in through these doors. Some from your past that you are connected to, that have hurt you, that have done you wrong, and you've not been freed from that tie to them. You are attached to them. You have unforgiveness toward them, bitterness toward them, anger toward them, resentment toward them. And it's harboring up bad feelings. Now I'm gonna show you some stuff here in a minute. But let me let me get on with this. The message this morning, breaking the ties of the past. This is what the Lord did me. Breaking the ties of the past. Forgiveness and healing. This is the word this morning because I want to see this church, I want to see us heal, and I want to see us move forward. Because this is what, if we, if we grow individually, we grow corporately. If one of us burns, we're all burning. You hear me? If one of us is growing, we're all growing. If one of us is happy, we're all happy. This is what God said. When one rejoices, we're all rejoicing. When one cries, we're all supposed to mourn. 
This is a family of body believers. Uh, well, they're not supposed to be disunity, disloyalty. This is a family of body believers uh, where forgiveness is born. Uh, this is a body of believers where love is shown. Uh, and this is a body where we must come together in the name of Jesus Christ uh, and show the love uh, and forgiveness and grace and mercy as the Father has shown upon us. Uh, we must show upon others. Woo, mighty God. Mighty God. I think Ephesians chapter 4. Let me look over here. I'm going to come right back to that. But Ephesians chapter 4. <coughs> you ain't, I got a lot of places to go. And I got a lot of verses if you're taking notes. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 26 says these words. Be angry and do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your wrath, nor give place to the devil. It says, be angry, don't sin. Do not let the sun go down on your wrath. Do not give place to the devil. I heard a story one time about this little uh, little boy. He got mad at his older brother. And all day long, he was so mad at his older brother, he would not talk to that older brother all day long. He started talking to him. Finally, at supper, they went to the dinner table. The mom seen it all day long. And she said, come on now. After the little boy got outside and got in the bed, she said, don't you think you need to say something to your brother? And he's like, Mama, I'm not talking to him. And she says, well, the Bible says don't let the sun go down on your wrath. And he said, Mom, how can I make the sun not go down? <laughs> See, he had it in his mind. He wasn't going to talk to his brother. And there's, see, this, we get it so much in our hearts that, that we are so angry with a person and we're so bitter at somebody that we're not going to talk to them. I don't care if i got to make the sun stay in the middle of the air. I'm not going to talk to them. What if God forgave the way we forgave? Every Sunday morning we pray, Lord, forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass. So we are saying, Lord, forgive us just like we forgive somebody else. Do we really want God to forgive us like we forgive others? Do we really want God to deal with us the way we deal with other people? Think about that. What if God dealt with us the way we deal with others? Mm. There's so many places. But did you see what it said in the Ephesians? It said, don't let the sin go down. Or don't let, sin, don't let the sun go down on your wrath. Don't give place to the devil. Don't give place. Man, don't even let that root of bitterness begin to rise up. Here's the thing. If you feel some kind of bitterness begin to spring forth inside of you, as a child of God, this is what you must do. I know at times it's hard, but here's what you must do. You better get that Holy Ghost axe out, uh, and you better get to chopping in the name of Jesus. Uh, uh, my God, forgive me for stuff uh, that I wouldn't want to be for. I wouldn't want to forgive somebody for that he forgive me. Uh, and in like manner, if I want to be forgiven, I got to forgive as well. Uh, and listen, forgiveness, you must understand something. We don't forgive as an obligation. Forgiveness is a gift for you. A lot of people take it as an obligation. A lot of people think, well, I'm a Christian. I'm obligated to forgive. If that's your take on it, then you're in the wrong mindset. If you think I'm obligated to forgive somebody, that's not true to forgiveness. Forgiveness is a gift for you. Because, see, you think, because I'm holding on to this thing, because a lot of people think the hurt, the pain, what this person done to me, they violated my rights, they hurt me bad. Brother, you don't understand what they've done. You don't understand what they've done in my life. They have messed me up. We understand that we cost Christ his life and we messed him up and while they nailed his hands and his feet after they beat his skin and ripped his everything off he looked over and said Father forgive them for they don't know what they do and even though we 
know what we do. And we still do it. He still steps out in heaven every time. That's what is so amazing about the grace of God is when we fall short of the glory of God, we fall short. And I know I'm a sinner saved by grace. I'm not speaking that over myself because I'm, I'm saved. I'm on my way to heaven. But I know for a fact that I'm one thing. I fall short of the glory of God. That I need a Savior. I need the Holy Ghost. I need Him every day. I need the Holy Spirit. Oh, don't leave me. Amen. And so, Mark says, if we want God in heaven to forgive us, then we must forgive our brothers and sisters of their trespasses. And there's so many different scriptures. Uh, Colossians chapter 3, uh, verses 12 through 16. Colossians 3. Let me turn to that one real quick. Colossians 3 says these words, Therefore, as the elect of God, holy and beloved, put on tender mercies, kindness, humility, meekness, long-suffering, bearing with one another. Y'all, now I know we don't like this. Bearing with one another. I've been bearing with Brother Bones for about 15 years. God knew I was going to have to get saved right before he come into the family. <laughs> and we've been long suffering with one another, have we? Yeah. Long suffering. Now, <laughs> it says bearing with one another and forgiving one another. If anyone has a complaint against another, even as Christ forgave you, so also you must do. But above all things, put on love, which is the bond of perfection. And then let, let the peace of God. See, unforgiveness, y'all. I'm going to come back to the Matthew. But unforgiveness, it, it begins to swell up inside of us. And it begins to hurt. Unforgiveness. Son, we know this. Unforgiveness is, is usually caused by, by major pain that has been done to us. And sometimes the, it's wounds that have cut deep. And unwillingness to forgive, what that does is it usually, have you ever had a, a bad old a sore? And it just begins to heal up, and you'll bump it on something, and it just opens it up again. Unforgiveness does that, and your sore will never, ever heal. But it keeps opening up wounds over and over and over. And unforgiveness begins to let the person who hurt you, it gives them power over you. You think you got power over that, but it gives them the power over you. It's not hurting them at all. You think they're losing any sleep at night over you sitting there tossing and turning about wondering what in the world if they would ever say they're sorry or not. Let me tell you something. Let me share this with you. And I'm not sure if I told y'all this yet or not. I may have. I know I told one or two in here. A few weeks ago, maybe a month or two ago, I had somebody come up to me and with tears running down their face, they said, Brother Chad, i got to apologize to you. And I said, what are you talking about? They said, for the last 20 years, I've hated you. I said, they what? For the last 20 years, I have hated you and I have thought that you were somebody else. So what are you talking about? I never knew this. I've seen this guy all my life, for the last 20 years, I've seen this guy in, in Carbon Hill all the time. And I never knew this guy hated my guts. And I said, what are you talking about? He said, 20 years ago, I was in an automobile accident right out here somewhere on Prospect Road. And I about lost my life. 
And I thought you was the guy that hit me. And he said, I've even told people in your church that it was you. And so I'm just letting y'all know it wasn't me. But anyways, this guy said, I have had to go see therapist for years to get my mind right. He said, I've had to go see therapists and people to talk to them because I've had this much hatred in my heart. I said, well, brother, I'm sorry you feel that way. He said, well, I'm done with it. He said, can you forgive me? I hugged his neck. I said, it's forgiven, brother. That's forgiven. I didn't ever know it, and, and I don't care. Look, it, that don't bother me. And it didn't bother me at all, but I didn't know this, brother. It was eating him up. There's no telling how much money and how many doctor's visits he went to. And I never even knew it. 20 years, this brother hated me. And then he comes up 20 years later and says, hey, I got to I gotta apologize. And you know what? I didn't say it's okay. Because a lot of times we'll look when somebody comes up to us to apologize, we'll say things like, it's okay, when it's not really okay. We got to look at them and we got to say, you're forgiven. I forgive you. Because a lot of times we'll say, oh, it's okay. And then it's not okay. Inside, we're really like, we're hurt. You know, that, that kind of, when he told me that, it didn't really hurt, but it like shocked me. And I'm like, wow. I've been going around with an enemy that hated me for 20 years. And I'm like, wow. I didn't, okay. But this, see how it affects somebody. It harbors feelings and resentment and bitterness. And so when anything like that pops up, immediately we must begin to get rid of it. Because bitterness begins to build. And it takes root. And bitterness turns to anger. And anger turns to wrath. Wrath turns to sin. And sin turns to death. It grows. It grows. And these wounds, listen, these wounds will keep growing and growing. Hebrews chapter 12. Let them know to go on with this one. Verse 14 of Colossians, it says, But above all these things, put on love, which is the bond of perfection, and let the peace of God rule in your heart, to which also you were called in one body, and be thankful. When we forgive, we are being released. We are being released and we begin to heal. When I told you a moment ago, forgiveness is not an obligation. It's not something you must do. Forgiveness is a gift that releases you to heal. Forgiveness. You know what it does? Forgiveness may leave a scar, but the pain is gone. Woo. And unforgiveness opens up the wound and it hurts and the pain is there and it causes depression and grief and bitterness and anger and wrath and all those things they begin to control you and rob your joy and rob your peace and rob your future and you'll toss and turn at night and you'll think and you'll question and you'll never experience true joy and satisfaction in life and you'll never get anywhere in Christ you will be stuck in the place where you're at Oh, you might be saved, but that's as far as you'll go. You'll never get to another level until you get rid of that unforgiveness, that bitterness, that hatred. And this is why I'm telling you this this morning. Because God's ready to shoot us. Hallelujah. He's ready to elevate us. He's ready to move from glory to glory to glory. And I'm ready to go. Amen. And we got to go as a body. Hey, come on, somebody. We gotta, are you ready to go? I'm ready to go where God has. I'm ready to experience what God has. Whatever he has for us. But we must first overcome. Like we've always said, we must learn and pass grade three before we can get to grade four. And so we must go through God's word. Anything God gives us, we must overcome and get to victory. Or we'll remain stuck in the place where we are until we overcome. It says, let the peace of God rule in your hearts to which you are also called. Look, verse 16, it says, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. That's this word of God. Let, let the word dwell in you richly in all wisdom and teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, 
singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. What does this mean, Brother Chad? I'm glad you asked. It means not only can you forgive this person who has hurt you, now, not all times can you do this. We'll talk about it in a minute. Not only can you forgive this person who has hurt you, but you can also pray for that person who has hurt you. You can sing to that person who has hurt you. Oh, I got one or two amen. Some of you still harboring feelings right now. I can feel it right now. You're looking at me with them evil eyes. I, I can, I, you can run right through me. Uh, let me tell you something. I hope if you're harboring feelings toward me like that, uh, you better let me know before the end of the service. Woo! Mighty God. Woo! Because I don't harbor feelings like that. I turn it over to God. I say, Jesus, vengeance is yours. Sink them, Holy Ghost. Because he, he can get them better than I can ever get them. The Bible said we don't have to worry about vengeance. God does that. Amen. God does that. Now, that's what Romans, if you're looking for that scripture, that's in Romans chapter 12, verses 19 through 21. Romans 12, verses 19 through 21. Hallelujah. It says, Beloved, do not avenge yourselves, but rather give place to wrath. For it is written, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. Therefore, if your enemy hungers, feed him. Amen. It didn't say punch him. Uh, did it? It said feed him. Amen. It didn't say feed him a knuckle sandwich. Now, I know some of you said, I'll feed him a knuckle sandwich. <laughs> Jesus, help us. <laughs> Lord, help us. It says feed him. It says if he thirsts, give him a drink. And not, <laughs> not poison. For in doing so, you will heap coals of fire on his head. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. Amen. Praise the Lord. Let me take some good wins every time. Amen. Good wins every time. Two evils. Listen, I know your mama used to teach you this. The man used to tell me that all the time. Two wrongs don't make a right. When someone harms you, like, you know, you harm them back. Don't make it right. And don't help you out. Praise the Lord. And so, let me go to Hebrews chapter 12 real fast. I'm going to get back to the message. But Hebrews 12, I'm just giving you a few places you can look at. Hebrews 12, 12 verses 14 and 15. Hebrews 12, look what this word says. It says, pursue. This means go after peace with all men. And holiness without which no one will see the Lord. Looking diligently, lest anyone fall short of the grace of God, lest any root of bitterness springs up, causes trouble, and by this many become defiled. Did you hear what that last part said? Lest anyone fall short, you got to look diligently. Take a look at your life, look inside. Because even there may be something that you have forgotten about. There may be some feelings you have forgotten about. And you need to look diligently. Lest anyone fall to the grace of God. And lest any root of bitterness spring up and cause trouble. By this many become defiled. i got to shed this jacket. Go ahead, bro. Hallelujah. Now, glory to God. Praise the Lord. Let me tell you about somebody. This is a true story, brother. They was a millionaire that bought this little bit of piece of property. It was a lot, a L-O-T, a lot in this rural suburb. And this lot was really crazy because it was only, uh, I think it was two yards wide, two yards wide by 100 feet long. So he couldn't really build nothing on it. And these people who own this this lot next to him, and there's somebody who owned this lot next to him. This millionaire, he buys that lot, and he says, you know what, I'll just sell it to one of the neighbors. And so he goes to one of the neighbors. This is a true story. He goes to one of the neighbors, and the neighbor, he said, I'll offer him this for it. He said, I'll give you this for it. That millionaire said, are you crazy, man? That's not one-tenth of what I give for it. 
He said, okay, well, go on then. You can't build nothing on it anyways. And so he goes to the neighbor next door. And he says, hey, here's this property that conjoins with yours. It can make your property better. And he offered him even less. And he said, what? He said, man, I got you over a barrel. He said, either take it or leave it. This millionaire got so upset, he goes back and he comes up with a plan. He builds a house on this little bitty lot that is five foot wide, a hundred foot long. You can only stick one stick of furniture in it. And he lives in this, this is true story. And he lives in that house till the day he died. He's a millionaire, but he lives in a house that's five foot wide. They called it the Spot House. They call it the Spot House. Five foot wide, 100 foot long. Because he wanted to show the neighbors he had unforgiveness toward them because they, they wouldn't pay him what they wanted to pay. So he put himself in a little bitty shack that if you stood up, you'd bump it in the walls. You see what I'm talking about? We, we put ourselves in situations where, where the walls are coming in around us all because we get upset with what people around us are doing. We gotta understand. Now, I'm no hippie, but my dad, he, he might have used to have been one back in the day. But he had this little saying. He always said, man, just let the loose end drag. And I don't know what that means, but I said, that's gotta be a hippie term. Just let the loose end drag. Sometimes, y'all, we just gotta let the loose end drag. When people say something that you don't like, let the loose end drag. Just let it go. Let it run off your back. Just say, hey, I'm not going to let what you say bother me. I'm not going to let it take my joy. I'm not going to let it take my peace. I'm not going to let it make me mad. I'm going to go on down the road because I know God's got something better for me anyway. Somebody needs to hear what we're saying. Don't let bitterness start rising up on the inside of you. God's got great plans for you. And he knows the plans that he has for you. Amen. Break those times. Sometimes we have cycles in our life to where we will get that way and we will repeat those cycles over and over and over and over. Anybody know what I'm talking about? Yeah. Like the children yeah. going round, 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 round. Yeah. We, we have cycles in our life. It's the same thing, those ties. We've got to break that ties in the name of Jesus. How do you do that? You do that by surrounding yourself with powerful praying people that knows their God. You surround yourself, hallelujah, and you get in prayer with the Lord Jesus. Amen. You get in the Bible, the Word of God. You begin to study that Word, and you begin to declare and decree, I am free because Jesus has made me free. Amen. Whatever it is that has you messed up in the mind, you get away from it in Jesus' name. If it's a person, abstain from that person. Delete them on social media. If you got to do it, whatever you got to do to get away from it that's causing you to fall, get away from it. Yeah. If you're able, if you're able, here's the thing. Forgiveness is not always reconciliation. A lot of people say, brother, I can forgive, but I can't forget. And I may be different, but I tell them, I don't want you to forget. I don't want you to forget. I want you to remember. And I want you to remember how you forgive that person and how you were released to heal when you forgave them. So do you remember the time when, when we were in church, when we were holding grudges toward people and the preacher preached a message about forgiving? Do you remember that that night? And about that time, went to that person and asked for forgiveness. And it was like we lost 20 pounds. I'm telling you, it was like 20 pounds left right then. Why? Because it was stuck to our body. It was stuck to our being mentally, physically, emotionally, spiritually. Unforgiveness will wear you out. It don't just affect you spiritually. It affects you all the way around. And Jesus talked about it over and over and over and over. And there's something very strong here we must look at. It. Luke verse 6 says, Love your enemies. Luke 6, 27 through 28. Love your enemies. Do good to them. 
But I'm going to look at something real quick. John chapter 8. John chapter 8. Praise God. John chapter 8. Verse 1. This is what it says. But Jesus went to the Mount of Olives. But early in the morning, he came again to the temple. And all the people came to him and he sat down and he taught them. Then the scribes and the Pharisees brought to him a woman caught in adultery. And when they had set her in the midst, they said to her, Teacher, this woman was caught in adultery in the very act. And Moses in the law commanded that such should be stoned. But what do you say? This they said, testing him, that they might have something of which to accuse him. But Jesus stooped down and wrote on the ground with his finger as though he did not hear. So when they continued asking him, he raised himself up and said to them, He who is without sin among you, let him throw a stone at her first. And again, he stooped down and he wrote on the ground. Then those who heard it being convicted by their conscience went out one by one, beginning with the oldest, even to the last. And Jesus was left alone, and the woman standing in the midst. When Jesus raised up himself and saw no one but the woman, he said to her, Woman, where are your accusers? Has no one condemned you? She said, No one, Lord. And Jesus said to her, Neither do I condemn you. Go and sin no more. I'm telling you, I'm thankful we serve a God of second chances. Not just a God of second chances, but a God of third chances and fourth chances and fifth chances. Because, Brother Chad, I have needed those chances. I have messed up and I have fell short. I have had to go to God. And I had to say, God, here I am again. I messed up. And Lord, I didn't mean to, but God, I'm repenting of my sins and I'm turning away. Lord, help me to, to learn and to live. Lord, to, to live this word and to quit following the trap of the enemy. I'm trying to be real with y'all this morning. Hallelujah. And I'm thankful that I serve a God that says I don't condemn you. Get, don't go back to that. Now, we won't leave that part out. Most times the preachers don't preach that part. But he said, go and sin no more. But the point I want to say is this. I love this. Second chances. Yes. Jesus is a God of second chances. Yes. Woo! The Bible said they caught this woman in the act of adultery. And they, they couldn't care less about her having uh, adultery, having an affair. Listen, if a virgin uh, was engaged... And uh, a guy come along in the street, and she's waiting on her husband to come back, or her one she's going to be married to. Huh? Yeah. And, and if, if this guy meets her and they get together, that was called adultery. And back in the Old Testament, they would drag them out in the streets and would stone them to death. Both of them. They would stone both of them. Now, at this time in the New Testament, they really wouldn't do that no more. But these Pharisees wanted to trap Jesus in his words because Moses in the law said to stone them. But they wanted to see if Jesus said forgive them, then they was going to take Jesus out and stone him. Woo! But I love what Jesus done. Oh, they come up, they threw the woman out. Where was the man, by the way? That's another story. But they threw the woman out there and said, Lord, we caught her in the act. And Jesus, what did he do? He comes up and he kneels down. And he takes the finger, which is the Exodus 31, the finger of God that wrote the tablets of stone, that wrote the Ten Commandments. The one that wrote uh, the Seventh Commandment that said thou shalt not commit adultery is the very finger of God that wrote in the sand that day. But he said... Uh, Woo! You that have the first sin or without first sin, cast the first stone. I believe, now this is Brother Chad's opinion. I had a Bible. The Bible don't say what he wrote in the sand. But I believe uh, all those religious leaders, he probably wrote every name of the women they was lusting after or ever been with uh, or every sin that they committed. Uh, and he began to write them. And one by one by one, once they began to see their names written down and their sin wrote out beside it, from the oldest to the youngest, they turned and run, uh, and they knew they was in the presence of the Lord God, and they had to go. Uh, and the Bible said that Jesus stooped down, uh, and he began to write some more. 
My God, let me tell you something. Uh, when he looked up, he said, Woman, where are your accusers at? Uh, are there nobody here? She said, None, Lord. Woo, where'd your condemners go? They're gone. He said, Well, neither do I condemn you. Now go and sin no more. Go and sin no more. Don't give place to the enemy. Cut ties. Cut ties with this person that you was having an affair with. Cut the ties. You can't keep playing around with it. That's what Jesus taught. If you want forgiveness, you better cut ties with sin. Amen. Cut ties with the past that would pull you back. Amen. Cut ties with all the things that was pulling you to hell. Amen. That's what he said. Go and sin no more. Now, let me go to 1 John 1.9. I'm going to read it. Well, let me just quote that to you. The Bible said, if we confess to the Lord Jesus Christ then our sins that he is faithful and just to forgive us of all of our sins and to cleanse us of all unrighteousness. What does that mean? If you, anybody in this room right now is wondering, will the Lord forgive me and give me a second chance? I got some good gospel news for you this morning. He so will. Amen. If I don't care if you messed up four or five times, honey, if you messed up 20 times a day, God said, you call on me. I'll forgive you and cleanse you. I am the one that pardons you and blocks out your sins. I cast them as far as the east is from the west, never to be brought up against you again. We serve a gracious, merciful God, a loving God. Amen. Who loves you. And so I want you to know we serve a good God. Ephesians 4. Ephesians 4. Let me read that one. Then I'll get back to my main one. Ephesians 4. Verse 30. Hallelujah. It says, And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God, by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Let all bitterness and wrath Anger, clamor. Y'all know what that is? Clamor. Loud quarreling. Sitting there bickering back and forth. Ain't no, that's nonsense. And that should never be in the house of God. That should never be in the house of God. Never. Now, let all bitterness, wrath, anger, clamor, evil speaking be put away from you with all malice. And be kind one to another, tender hearted, forgiving one another, just as Christ in or just as God in Christ also forgave you. Praise the Lord. And in Matthew 5 7, it says, Happy are those who are merciful to others, for God will be merciful to them. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. Happy are those who are merciful to others for God. That was the Beatitudes. For God will be merciful to them. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. See, forgiveness breaks the power of the past. Come on now. Your past, if it tries to pull back up, forgiveness breaks the power of the past. Forgiveness breaks chains. Forgiveness breaks strongholds. Forgiveness sets captives free. Amen. When you are still thinking about the person who harmed you, you are letting them pull your strings. You are a puppet and they are the string master. You are giving them power over your life. You are letting them raise you back up and letting them affect you mentally, physically, spiritually. But in the name of Jesus, today be the day that those chains are broken. Those strings need to be cut uh, and let the Lord set you free. Amen. Praise God. Forgiveness frees us and leads us to emotional healing. Even if there's no reconciliation, sometimes reconciliation takes two people. Not all the times are you going to be able to be reconciled. But if you forgive, then it's not when you stand before God, you know what God's going to say? You've done your part. If you forgive, then you are released. You've done your part. 
if they don't forgive you back, brother, that's on them. That's on them. You know, forgiveness is not always forgiving. Forgiveness is not always forgiving. You're not always going to be able to forget the hurt, the trauma, all the things that's been done. But know this, you will, when you, when you remember that, I want you to remember the freedom that you found when you forgave. The experience that you received, the experience you received when you turned the offender, when you let them go. Forgiveness frees us, leads us to healing. Forgiveness stops the ongoing cycle. Praise God. Breaks chains. Unresolved pain is a result of unwillingness to forgive. People who refuse to forgive have been wounded and they keep reopening that wound. When we forgive, there's a scar, but there's no pain. Oh, praise God. I asked you earlier, it's risky to pray forgive us of our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. What if we dealt with us like that? Do we really want God to be as forgiven as we are? Being unwilling to forgive is like destroying a bridge that we ourselves are going to need to cross. You hear me? Mm -mm. Being unwilling to forgive. Here's the process of forgiveness. Don't deny feelings or hurt or anger, but acknowledge those feelings and commit to do something about them. You hear me? Don't, don't disacknowledge that there's pain there. There's anger. There's hurt. You need to acknowledge that. But what you need to do is make a decision today. I'm doing something about it. I'm changing that today. Pain has no thought, no reason to be in my life no more. Christ has set me free. Anger has no reason to be in my life no more. I'm a son of God. Christ has made me set free. I am not going to let it stay in my life and in my mind any longer. I am free because Christ has made me free. I'm making the change today. I'm coming out. I'm not going to be a puppet on the screen. I'm not giving on power no more. I'm going to be free. Hallelujah. Today. Today I'm going out. Amen. Hallelujah. Today I'm going to do something about it. You see in Matthew 18, the verse that I read, Peter said, come to the Lord. He said, Lord, how many times should I forgive my brother? Up to seven times. See, Jewish law, in, in the book of Amos, Jewish law said three times. And the fourth time they was done. And Peter said, what about seven times? He was trying to impress the Lord. Peter always tried to impress everybody. That's just who he was. He said, what about seven times? And Jesus said, Peter, up to 70 times seven. And I want you to understand this. Jesus was not given an answer of 490 times. He was saying unlimited as many times as it takes. Forgiveness is not a number thing. Forgiveness is is unlimited. Forgiveness should be however many times it takes for you to heal. Forgiveness is however many times it takes for you to release and be released. Amen. Hear me this morning. Sometimes it takes more than once. Amen. Some of you got trauma and hurt. We've had people come and sit on our back porch recently that have been seriously traumatized by their past. And I know I know we've got some real close to us that was that way. And I know how hard it must be. I don't know, but I, I can imagine how hard it must be to overcome. But I want you to know you can overcome it. Jesus can help you get through it, and he can set you free from that pain. Peter said up seven times. Jesus said, no, up to seven times seven. The number seven means Completion, perfection, unlimited. And so it goes on. Therefore, the kingdom of heaven is like a certain king who wanted to settle accounts with his servants. When he had begun to settle accounts, one was brought to him who owed him 10,000 talents. you got to understand something. 10,000 talents. Lord have mercy. This was billions of dollars. Billions that they could never pay back. That they could never pay back. Billions. I said with a V. 
But as he was not able to pay, his master commanded that he be sold with his wife and children and all that he had and that payment be made. And the servant that owed the billions, he fell down before him and said, Master, have patience with me and I will pay you all. The master of that servant was moved with the compassion and he released him and he forgave him the debt. Notice what he said right here. The master, the servant owed him billions of dollars that he could not pay. The servant owed a debt that he could not pay. Somebody get this in just a moment. He owed a debt he could not pay. He needed someone to wash it away. And the master said, I release you. I free you from the debt. That master in this parable is our Lord and Savior. Did somebody hear that slang right there? Our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. When he died for us, he set us free. He forgave us. Hallelujah. And released us. Every one of us in this room was on our way to the devil's hell because we owed a debt we could not pay. Not one of us in here. But because we went to the master and we said, Lord, be patient with us. And that be patient with us, it still says that we think we can work out our salvation. We can't do it. But you got to understand this by his grace alone. Grace through faith in him. Hallelujah. All right, let me get back to it. He said, the servant fell down before him, saying, Master, have patience with me, and I'll pay y'all. The master and servant was moved with compassion, released him, forgave him the debt. But then that servant went out and found one of his fellow servants who owed him a hundred denarii. That's a hundred days' wages. And they said this was like four hundred and something dollars. Four hundred and something dollars compared to the billions that he was owed. This person just got released from billions of dollars. And now somebody owes him hundreds and he grabs them by the throat and says, you're going to pay me what you owe me. You see, he says to his master, after he found out, his master called and said to him, you wicked servant, I forgave you all the debt because you begged me. Should you not also have had compassion on your fellow servant just as I had pity on you? His master was angry and delivered him to the torturers until he should pay all that was due to him. And so my heavenly father also will do to you if each of you from his heart does not forgive his brother his trespasses. So many times we go to God for forgiveness and yet we can't forgive our brothers, our sisters. And when we don't and can't forgive our brothers and sisters, I wonder, do we realize fully that God forgives us? Or do we trust that God does forgive us? And I wonder sometimes when God forgives us, do we fully forgive ourselves? Somebody hear me now. Because a lot of people struggle with that. When God forgives you, you're forgiven. You need to quit bringing up your past. Your past is gone, honey. When Jesus washes you of your sin, it's gone. Never to be brought up again. You need to quit bringing it up. God's got rid of it. Forgive yourself. You are not the same person that you used to be. You are a new creature in Christ. And God is making you new every single day. Amen. Those old things are gone. The new has come. Those things are gone. The ties will pass be cut in Jesus' name. Woo, hallelujah. I'm going to pray that prayer today over everybody in this room. But the Bible says that uh, we are to forgive. Forgive others because we have been forgiven. We don't understand how important that is. If we don't forgive, we are not forgiven. Plain and simple. I can't say it no simpler than that, y'all. If we can't forgive, if you got one person that you're holding a grudge against, we can't be forgiven. Amen. It's that simple. Amen. I can't make it any simpler. I'm trying, but that's, that's as easy as I can put it. That's not Brother Chad's words. That's God's word. That's God's word. And that's the word we go by. Hallelujah. We're not going to sugarcoat it, water it down and change it. It's God's word. Amen. Amen. The process of forgiveness. Don't deny your feelings. Acknowledge him. Number two, make a conscious decision. Do not seek revenge or hold on to grudges, but decide to forgive 
and let go. Forgive and let go. Amen? Amen. Number three, think differently about the offender. Whoever it is that hurts you. Whoever it might be, family member, friend, somebody you don't even know. Whoever it might be, you got to understand that just as we are rotten, dirty sinners, so is that person who did that to you. Every one of us is in need of a Savior. We're all messed up. Amen. We're all messed up. Why do you think we're here this morning? We're messed up. This is the hospital. We come for a healing. We come for help. Hallelujah. We come for a Savior. Praise the Lord. And Jesus, we know we need Jesus. And he shows up for us every time. Praise God. I thank the Lord that he does too. We got to think differently. And, and you know what? A lot of times we think when we forgive somebody that we are condoning what they do. You are not condoning what they do at all. But you are releasing yourself in order to heal. And you are releasing them in order that you can grow. Hallelujah. But think differently about the offender. Number four. Accept the pain that you've experienced without passing it on to others including the offender. So many times when one person hurts us we will pass it on to anybody that comes in front of us. Hear me, somebody. In this room right now, just because you get mad at one person, don't you dare pass it on to the people around you. Get rid of that. As soon as it pops into your life, you begin to cast it out right in Jesus' name. We can't show the love of Jesus if we're snapping on people all the time. We can't show the love of Jesus if we're letting that bitterness get root in our life all the time. Get rid of it as soon as it comes. In Jesus' name. Think about it. All right, number five. Think about, and all we got to think about how it feels to be released from a burden or a grudge. I'm going to tell you, it feels so good. It feels so good. Be released. Number six, seek meaning in the suffering that you've experienced. There is a meaning. There is in something. There's a reason why you went through what you went through. Maybe it's for a testimony. Somebody down the road, you went through something so that you'll be able to share your testimony with somebody else. There's a reason you went through what you went through. You just got to find that meaning and that purpose, what it was. Amen. Number seven, see the offender as a tool that God is using to build character in you. So many times in Scripture, God used mountains and trials and people to build things into God's men and women. God would use many different things in the Bible. And you know what it would do? It would cause character to grow in them. It would cause, cause them to grow and learn how to get a hold of God even that much more. Last but not least, number eight, realize the paradox of forgiveness. As you forgive the offender, you are being released and are experiencing spiritual and physical healing so you can move forward with the peace and the clarity that God has in your life. Amen. So you're forgiven the offender, but you are the one that's experiencing the forgiveness and the peace and the clarity. There's a paradox to that. It's because it's for you. It's because it's for you. We must forgive so that we can be forgiven. Would you stand all over the house and come up here with us? I hold, I, I hold a bag, held a bag grudge against someone that shot me. And the other night, I, there's something that's grabbed me and telling me that I needed to go to New Life Fellowship. And I got up there and we were sitting there in the back row and and uh, I saw him. And I just, I looked at Braxton and I said, I gotta go talk to him. And I went and talked to him and it, and it helped me and it helped him even more. And he just said that I'm glad that this happened. Yes. And you know, holding drugs is hard. In fact, it helped me more than I need to share that. That's right. Amen. Yes, sir. Please, 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 please
Thank you. Moses holding on to him, it affects you. And it not only affects you uh, spiritually, it affects you mentally and physically. It affects your body. Because worry, Brother Dave, worry is a, a, is a killer. It's just stress, anxiety. It's a killer. And it, it affects your whole being. So I pray today that you be released. Can, I, can we pray over each one? You got something, brother? No. You just praising God? I got you. I got you. Can we pray over y'all today? And then we're going to open up these altars if anybody needs prayer. Father, in the name of the law name, it's the wonderful name of Jesus. Lord, you give us this word today. And Lord, I know this word is straight from you, God. And Lord, I pray that you would touch every heart that's under the sound of my voice right now. Lord God, I pray if there's anybody that has unforgiveness or bitterness, Lord, or, or anger or wrath or a grudge, Lord, that right now they would begin to lay that down. God, as you forgave us, help us to forgive others. Lord, we know your word said that if we want forgiveness in our lives, if we want to be forgiven, then we must forgive. So, Lord, I pray right now, let us be sincere in releasing forgiveness and releasing those who have harmed us, those who have hurt us. God, I pray you help us to overcome and, and not want to hold on to that. And, Lord, help us to realize that we're giving them that much more power over us. Lord, we're... we're this stuff. Lord, I don't understand why we want to hold on to that, but help us to release it right now in Jesus' name. Everyone in this room, God, I pray, give them power from on high yes. to release any grudge, any unforgiveness, any harboring of feelings, of hurt feelings and bad feelings. And Lord, I pray, free us today. And Lord, help us to forgive any person that has done us wrong, any person, God, Lord, that might have hurt us traumatized us in our past. Lord God, you know what they are, who they are. Lord, those watching my video right now, the same for them, I pray. Lord, that you would forgive them. Lord, as they forgive others. And Lord God, I pray for my wife and myself. Lord, as leaders of this house, I pray that you help us. Lord, if there is any, any unforgiveness or bitterness or wrath or any kind uh, that tries to spring forth, Lord, cut it down. In Jesus' name, Lord, get rid of it. We forgive all. And Lord, I pray that the any that has fought against us, Lord, or unforgiveness toward us, Lord, that they forgive us. Lord, we just give you all the praise right now. Lord, save, Lord, all of us. Save us, God. Lord, come into our lives. Change us. Make us new. Lord, break every chain off of our lives. Free us, Lord. Help us to never be the same from this day forward. In Jesus' name, we thank you, we love you, and we give you all praise. It's in your mighty name we pray. Amen. Amen. And amen. Hallelujah.